worship. So dear God, bless you. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. We enter into worship with hands and hearts and voices lifted to heaven. Be magnified in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Hey, everyone, let's worship the Lord. Lift your hands and sing, God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. And, and that, that is, is his, his nature. nature. Come on, lift your voice, church, and worship God. Oh, oh.
that's an encouragement to everybody who's waiting on the Lord. Uh, let's pray one more time before we get into God's word. Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Thank you for the opportunity to look to you. Thank you for the, uh, the hope that you have given us, the faith that you have given us, uh, the way that you have shown us, and that way is Jesus Christ. So Father, here we are. We're waiting for you. The Bible says the man, the woman that waits on the Lord renews their strength that we mount up on eagle's wings, that we run and we will not grow weary, that we will walk and we will not faint. I pray that, dear God, the inner gale, the energy of the Holy Spirit for every man and woman and child who hears and believes as I do, that your word is good and that your spirit will bring everything to fruition that has been spoken over us. Thank you for, this word. Thank you for the word that's about to go forth and the ears that are hearing it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, everybody. Hallelujah. Good to see you this morning. Um, I'm sorry I can't hear you. It's Jackie's fault. She has you muted. But uh, uh, we'll unmute a little bit later that we all can shout at each other <laughs> and give a hallelujah to the Lord. Um, I pray that this is a hallelujah word for you. Uh, it has to do with wisdom and maturity. I want to speak to you over these next weeks, at least throughout the month of November, about wisdom and maturity. Um, and, and I believe it'll be a, a pertinent conversation for us because I don't know about you, but um, I believe the pursuit of wisdom right now is, uh, it, it ought to be the activity with which you and I 
are consumed right now. If there's an obsession that is, uh, and I use that word advisedly, if there's an obsession that you and I can afford to have is the obsession to get close to Jesus. It's the obsession that we need with gaining wisdom. And I hope and pray that each and every one of you are gaining in wisdom day in, day out. You're becoming more and more wise because of the attention that you pay to the one who is wise, because of the attention that you pay to Jesus. In Philippians 4, 11, 13 through 13, uh, Paul says this to us. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full to, and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Ah, what a sweet word that I believe is very, very uh, important for you and me to embrace right now. You see, when it comes to spiritual wisdom and spiritual maturity, contentment is, is, is a decision. It's a choice that you and I make. Contentment isn't just something that rises up. Contentment is a choice. There are all kinds of things that rise up. But if I am content, it's because I've chosen to look upon the thing that helps me to focus on the Lord. That's why I am content. That's why I realize that whether things are at their best or things, circumstances are at their worst, that Jesus sits on the throne of my heart. And whether or not Jesus sits on the throne of my heart is my decision. Okay, I get to exercise that decision and I get to be the one who determines what's most important to me and what I focus on. And God holds me responsible for that. He has set Jesus before me. And if I take into to my heart what God has set before me, I will always come to the conclusion that God sees and knows everything and he is in control. And therefore I am content. And beloveds, contentment sounds and looks and acts and speaks like something. Contentment is sweet and it is gracious and it is quiet and it is humble and it is still and it is small, especially, especially when things, when, the, when, when circumstances might dictate otherwise. So the contentment that Paul talks to us about here in, in Philippians speaks of the decision that I make to, to take God at his word and to let every circumstance and happenstance, let all the chips fall where they may, because God is faithful and his promises are sure. You need to say that to yourself often during the week. God is faithful. His promises are sure. Now, see, these are, I believe that everything that, that, everything that we embrace about the, about the Lord, everything that we embrace when it comes to things of faith, is going to have is going to be tested through the circumstances that God allows in our lives. I don't believe faith is a standalone thing. As a matter of fact, I believe faith stands in the midst of everything that's going on around us. Faith doesn't take us away from the things that are difficult and the things that are hard, the circumstances that are arduous. Faith helps us to be successful in the midst of those things. In fact, we don't really know faith until we don't know uh, the quality of our faith until it is tested. And so Paul, as he was writing these words, beloved, Paul was in prison. Okay, these are not words that he just wrote because he had some spiritual thoughts. I think a lot of us, we speak words because we're having a spiritual moment. And I, I hear a lot of prophecy, a lot of prophecy, for instance, over these last weeks have gone out about the nation and about 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 the election, about who's going to get elected, about what God's angels are doing, and and God's sending angels from Africa and, and different places, and and doing this and doing that over there, and that that is fine. Let that let that be as it may, but that is not that is not a matter of faith. A matter of faith is is that I may not understand what's going on all around me, and I may not have all the answers, and there's none of us who do. Okay, no matter how much we prophesy and. And, 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 and we may proclaim that we do. None of us do. None of us see what God sees. But what we have to see is Jesus Christ 
in the midst of it. So here's Paul in prison writing about contentment. Who writes about contentment from prison? It seems to me that that would be the last thing that he was writing about. Seems to me he might be writing about the revolution or what God is going to do to break him out of prison and and and, and sit the right powers on the thrones and, and dominions of the earth. And, and all. But no, he was in prison and he could not see with his own eyes. He could not even predict uh, uh, according to the circumstances that he saw, the day that he would be victorious. But he chose to see things from a victorious standpoint. See, when you're content, you choose to see the victory. You choose to see the victory because the scripture continually, continually tells you that God is at work no matter what the circumstance and that he is going to prove himself strong on your behalf. When David, uh, for instance, was at one of his lowest points, so low that his own men were thinking about killing him uh, because of things that had happened to them. The circumstances were so bad. The Bible says he withdrew and he strengthened himself in the Lord. He saw the circumstance according to the leading of the Lord and his relationship with God when things got difficult, drew him apart to the Lord, drew him away from people and drew him to the Lord. Might I say for you and for me right now, it might be best to draw away from people and all that people have to say and all that people think and draw apart to the Lord because that's where our contentment comes from and that's where our steadiness comes from. And that's how we can be in the midst of a very difficult situation. Paul was incarcerated and yet he's writing to us about contentment. He said, I know how to be a base. I know how to have nothing. And I know how to, how to have much more than I need. And the thing that's consistent, whether I abase or whether I'm abased or abounding, the thing that's consistent is that God is good, is that I am settled in his hands and I have already given all things to him and trust him that he's going to do the right thing by me and, and by everyone around me. That's my contentment when it comes to my family. That's my contentment when it comes to my church. You know, are we in a place right now where things are what we would have them be when it pertains to uh, the church and our worship? I, I would think not. I think that uh, the people that are, are here with me now are the same people who are in the room with me every time we gather. And so we know what it is that, that we're called to do and where we're called to be. And this is different than it has ever been, at least in my lifetime. But yet here we are and we're content. It is not ideal. It is not perfect. It is much more ideal and perfect in my mind to be with you. But here we are using what God has given us, whether we are based or bound. Here we are in the fellowship of believers, paying attention to God's word. And God's word this morning is telling us to set aside all that unhappiness all that dissatisfaction, all that, uh, all, all, all of that, that, uh, that which would, would separate us and to stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life for us so that we could live. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And there's a contentment uh, that comes to you because you have made the choice to look to the Lord. So it, if anyone deserved to be, to think about once again about Paul's state. Uh, he was writing these words, he was writing from prison, um, and if, if anyone deserved to be treated with respect and reverence, it was Paul, because of the life that he had laid down for so many. But yet it is, here he is, suffering greatly at the hands of men, magistrates, kings, and mostly religious folks, mostly religious folks. As a matter of fact, Jesus is suffering. Most of his suffering, most of his difficulty, should I say, when it came to dealing with people on earth, most of those difficulties came at the hands of religious folks. I want to say that to you. I want to say that clearly to you because I think it's very important for you to right now avoid religious people because what you hear, religion often, often masquerades as righteousness, but it is no more than religion, which, which, which uh, does not have the relationship with, with Christ and the Holy Spirit that speaks sweetly and kindly and graciously into every subject. One of the ways you know religion as opposed to the spirit speaking is religion has to be right and its way has to be right and you have to be wrong if you disagree. That is the spirit of religion. That is the spirit that came against Jesus Christ and, and out of all, the, out of, all of the, the, the wars that he had to fight, um, his most pointed ones were with religious people. Uh, it wasn't with the magistrates or, 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 the, or the, the political leaders of the day because he didn't play political games. He didn't, he didn't even enter into the political landscape at all. And I might say that as a word of, of direction to you. 
Jesus did not speak in the political landscape at all. He had a different kingdom that he was establishing. Why is it so that so many of us feel that, that it is God's intention to establish a religious kingdom here on earth and do what he's going to do through politicians? Uh, that is anti-biblical, it's antithetical to the New Testament. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Let all of those chips fall where they may. Do your part as, as being a, 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 a part of the conversation. Do your responsibilities um, as a citizen and, and be the best citizen you possibly can be. And when you walk with Jesus, you will be the best citizen you can possibly be. Vote as you like, a, a, as you feel you should. And, and, and remember that none of those things really are the, that, that which is most important to God. What's most important to God is that you find yourself in Christ being content and being a blessing to him no matter what the circumstance. Okay, if Paul can write about contentment from a prison, then you and I can rise up off of our comfortable beds and give God glory. Amen. As a matter of fact, just take a quick second, lift your hands right where you are and give him a shout. I think he deserves a shout. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Your grace is sufficient for us today. So to finish off with what I was saying about Paul, he was coming to the end of his life. It was not going to end the way that he wanted it to end. But yet and still, Paul is writing to you and me about what it is to be content. And let me say as, as, as a preacher of the gospel that I've learned that no matter what state I'm in, that when I stand before you, I have to rightly represent Jesus Christ and whatever mood or whatever circumstance um, that uh, it, it, it is, is true of my life, that is not the important thing. The important thing is that Jesus Christ is on the throne of my worship. And when I stand before you, I stand before you as one who's looking to the Lord, looking to the Lord for myself and looking to the Lord for what to share with you. And I want to share with you, beloveds, be content, be still, know that he is God. You are hidden under the shadow of his wings. He has you, he knows what you need. Uh, and if things are difficult, give him even more glory. Be more determined than ever to glorify the Lord, even in your prison, you know, even in your limitations. You know, I hear a lot of music, a lot of songs about no limitations, no limits, and, and all those things in Christ Jesus. But that is also not true. God has trusted you and me with limitations. He's trusted you and me with things that are not yet. He's trusted me, you and me, with things for which we are waiting, things for which we're hoping. And you and I must be trustworthy in those moments as we wait for God to work things out on his terms. You know, I feel sorry for a Christian that doesn't have anything in their life that they wish was different, <laughs> anything to hope for. You know, if you have everything, why do you need hope? You know, so it's it's okay that we don't have everything the way we would like it to be. Uh, the great thing, though, is that we have hope that God is going to make everything. He's going to bring everything to an agreement with his word as it pertains to you. Okay, so as it pertains to you, beloved, God is working something out. Let him work it out. As it pertains to your brothers and sisters, God is working something out. Let him work it out. Don't you work it out for God. We often get involved in other people's lives and other people's faith in ways that we ought not. Let God work these things out in people and let us be an example and let our lives of faith be a testimony instead of us having to speak in the lives in the ways that God has not ordained. There are too many, in my opinion, speaking under the authority of, of scriptures as so they say. But what they say, obviously, because as, as we see the outworking of things, is not the word of the Lord. So if you take it upon yourself to speak the word of the Lord in anyone's life, let it be a word of encouragement. Let it be a word of strengthening. Let it be a verse, that Bible, the verse of the Bible that God has encouraged you with. Let it, be, let it be exhortation. Let it be, yes, yes, God is with you. God is for you. Yes, I am praying with you. I'm standing with you. I love you. And I'm calling on the name of the Lord for you. And leave it at that, beloveds. Leave it at that. The Lord will speak for himself. Okay? The Lord will speak for himself. You be content and speak words that help others turn to Jesus so they might find the same contentment 
that you have found. So, you know, there, there are those who choose to find their comfort in things other than their relationship with God, but that's very different from the contentment that God has for us. You know, I, I have long stopped looking for contentment in the United States of America. And I bring that up because I know that after last week's election and all that it took to, to come to the conclusion of, of, of the voting, that, um, that there is a tremendous amount of uh, angst and tremendous amount of, of disappointment in some and tremendous amount of joy in others and everyone has their reasons and that's all well and good. But my question is who is content in Jesus Christ? It's one thing if you're content because things went the way that you would like them to go. It's another thing if you are, are not content because they did not go the way that you wanted them to go. But, but let me ask you one way or another, is Jesus Christ on the throne? And if he's on the throne, then I can say like Paul, I've learned to have my way. I've learned that when things don't go my way to be content in Jesus and beloved, it sounds like something. It looks like something. It loves like something. It doesn't whine and complain and growls and point fingers and it does not act ugly. Contentment is, is a sweet place for you to be. It's a sweet choice, the sweetest choice that you can make in the midst of whatever the circumstances. Uh, it, it, we're taking the Lord at his word and we have chosen because of a relationship with Jesus that he is our contentment, our fullness, our focus, our prize, our hope, and our peace. Okay, the more difficult, the more stressful the moment, the greater the contentment for those who choose contentment in that moment. So if everyone around you is not content, you be an example. Okay, just be an example. Everyone around you may be very unhappy at this moment um, about or, or the last weeks or the last months or the last however long. You know, but I find that contentment is a state that, that, that it is a lifestyle that you and I choose. And once again, it looks like it acts like something. So how many of the Christians, let me ask you this, how many Christians that you know walk in contentment, walk in this satisfaction that there is that God is good? And that he has their, he has all of our best interests at heart and he loves us and he is going to work out all things according to his word and according to his promises. How many of us walk that walk and live that life? Because it is a life. It is a lifestyle decision. And it is the most important decision I think that you can make today that, okay, I'm going to lay all that down, all any angst whatsoever, and I'm going to rejoice in the Lord always. Um, Aaron and Mimi and Jackie and I, uh, uh, we seek to give you uh, uh, music to be content by. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always, we just sang this morning. And, and Lord, you are good, and your mercy endures forever. And Lord, as things are changing, we'll be standing here waiting on you no matter how long it takes, no matter what the path is that we will not take our eyes off of Jesus Christ. We're not looking for a change in circumstance. It's great if we get a chance to see that. We are looking for a change of heart and not other folks' hearts, but my heart. And as a pastor, I hope to see a change in the heart um, of my people. I, I hope to see you, know, you continually, to continuing to grow and to, and to move forward um, in, your, in your walk with the Lord, to continue to grow and move forward in the maturity to which God calls us, that you and I are not blown back and forth and to and fro by elections and 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 by politicians and 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 and, and by judges and, and 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 laws and legislation and that type of thing, as if laws and legislation and justice can bring about the will of God in the earth. I think the one thing that we realize if you actually read your Bible and believe it, that laws and legislation legislations and judges and presidents and kings do not do not, unless they walk in the spirit, they will not bring about the will of God. That's not how God brings about his will. If that was true, Jesus would not have had to have died. If the law was sufficient, Jesus would not have to have died. If the old covenant was sufficient, there would be no need for a new one in his blood. But there was a need because nothing that laws can do or Supreme Court justices or anybody that we elect can do is going to let you cannot legislate righteousness. And Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And that's you, beloveds. You make sure that you are that church without spot or wrinkle or anything with which God would be dissatisfied. 
And as your pastor, that's my job to remind you that that's the important thing. The important thing is not who gets elected or who doesn't. The important thing is that when you stand before the Lord, you're able to say that you have walked in righteousness and he's able to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. I have trusted you and you have been trustworthy. I've given you my spirit and you have been trustworthy to pay attention to what I have given you. So beloved, pay attention to life. Pay attention to where God has placed you. Pay attention to the household, the relationships. Pay attention to those that you love. Pay attention to those who love you. Pay attention to, to, your, to, to being the kind of neighbor that you can be. And that's the, the word neighbor, it's, it's a big word. It has everybody I have an opportunity to bless is my neighbor. Everybody I have an opportunity to help is my neighbor. Anybody who I, I, I have an opportunity to interact with uh, is, is a neighbor. And how I treat my neighbor um, says everything about whether or not I know the Lord. Because love does no harm to its neighbor. I have to ask myself, is there anything that I am doing or have done or is part of my life that is harmful to anyone around me? Because love does no harm to anyone else. Amen. Let that be, let that be a, a, a litmus test for what you support. Love does no harm to its neighbor. And you cannot call a person, a godly person who is harmful to other people. Okay, I didn't even I, I, I didn't even mean to go there, but I'm going to go there because I think it needs to be said. You and I cannot call somebody a godly person or a servant of the Lord whose behavior, whose words, whose deeds, whose actions are harmful to other people. You know, as a Christian, I would hope that not one of my Christian brothers and sisters could come to me and say that person is harmful to me, and I would I would not take that seriously or I would find myself in support of someone who is harmful to you. That is the basic premise, tenet of love, that love does no harm to its neighbor, nor does it partner with anyone or anything that does harm to another. And so beloved, let us be pure in our decisions. Let us be pure in the stances that we take. And in that purity and in that righteousness, we'll find contentment because we will be right on point with the love of God in Jesus Christ. It looks like something when we walk with the Lord. It looks like something when we focus on Jesus Christ. And it looks like love. And love always blesses its neighbor. Remember the Good Samaritan. Remember all of the examples of love that we're given in the scriptures. And it never does harm to another person. So listen carefully, beloveds. Listen carefully. And you'll hear the Lord leading you in the spirit to love. And there's contentment in love because Christ, Jesus Christ is love. God is love and Jesus is God. He, Jesus is our contentment, he's our fullness, he's our focus, he's our prize, he's our hope once again, and he's our peace. Choose him today, choose him today. That is, you're able to choose him because you have the mind of Christ and the mind of Christ cannot be disturbed or upset with worries that haunt those who don't know Christ. So I, I'm always, um, I always take note of, of those of us who claim to know Christ, but we're still so such malcontents. Um, and we have so little good to say about anyone else other than ourselves or what or those who are in our quote unquote camp. I'm, I'm really also taken aback by all the camps that there are uh, supposedly in Christendom. But there are no camps in Christ, beloved. Uh, there are no conservative camps. There are no liberal camps. You know, there are no moderate camps. Jesus is none of those things. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's no pro camps. There's no con camps. There's, there's no I'm for this. There's no isms, no schisms. None of those in the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom, then you're one with God in Christ and you are content and he is content with you. And that's what matters. Nothing else matters. I want to finish up with two, two scriptures that are, um, that, are, that are anchors for me. Uh, in my life on a daily day daily day to day basis they keep me rooted and they keep me grounded and and uh one is from psalm uh 37 uh as 37 3 it says this very simply trust in the lord and do good that's instruction to you beloveds that's a command to you if you're a child of god that's an encouragement that is a command trust in the lord and do 
good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Dwell, trust in the Lord, do good. Okay, if you're going to be one that claims to love and know the Lord, then you will be found trusting him and you will be found doing good to others. Never partner with anyone or anything that does harm to other people. It is not Christ. It is not Christian. It doesn't represent the Lord and the Lord is not a part of it. What a sad thing if we think that God is into something that he isn't when the word makes very, very clear that he is a loving and kind and gracious God. And that is his requirement for you too. Okay. Be like Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. And it says this in Psalm 131. It's this, it's this a very short chapter and it's a, the, the, the entire three verses of the chapter it says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. I want to stop right there because I think there's so many people right now speaking authoritatively into things uh, where God has not given them authority. Uh, God has not given me authority over governments and over nations, so I'm not going to speak authoritatively over governments and over nations. And I think that we preachers and prophets and spiritual advisors, quote unquote, ought to stop it because uh, God has certainly not given us that authority. So why would he give us the word for something which he's given us no authority? Let us speak authoritatively in places where he has given us authority and, and not beyond that. So this is David saying, and David's a king. He had every reason to think of himself highly, but he said, I don't, my heart is not, not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. I don't think that highly of myself. I don't concern myself with great matters, no things too profound for me. And this is a king speaking, beloved. If he can say these words, we ought to be able to say them. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. And he's speaking to Israel, he's speaking to the people of God, the covenant people of God. I'm speaking to the covenant people of God. Hope in the Lord. Do not place your hope in any man. It is great when a man shows himself to be trustworthy uh, with the things that God has given him. That is wonderful. But remember, God never called us to trust in a man except the man, Jesus Christ. So we are never called, never called. Men are never called to trust in other men. But all of us who are in Christ are called to be worthy of trust. And I want you to see that tension there. It is a good biblical scriptural tension. You know, none of us, God not called anybody to trust in Eric. He's not called anybody to trust in you or, 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 or Greg or, or Aaron or Cody or, or, or David. He hasn't called anybody to trust in Paul. He hasn't called anybody to trust in any of us. But he's called us to be trustworthy. And so let us do the job that he's given us to do and let him do the job that only he can do. Only he is worthy of all the trust and faith that we can muster. And people who walk in Christ will find are trustworthy just like he is. So our job is to be close to Jesus. If we're close to Jesus, we will be what he has ordained for us to be. It's found in our proximity. It is found in our closeness to the Lord. So draw near to him, beloved. Now, back to the, 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 the Psalm 37, I'll, I'll say this in, in conclusion. Dwell in the land, and feed on his faithfulness, it says that the second half of, 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 of uh, Psalm 37.3. That's instruction to me. Dwell where he's placed you, okay? Be content where he's placed you, okay? The, if you may not be in a season of abounding. It may be a season where you have just barely enough, but rejoice in that season. There's something that God is pouring out on you and into you in this season. Rejoice in this season. Let it be so that anyone looking at you would think that your circumstances were marvelous, okay? Let it be that they think your circumstances are the best ever because when they see your smiling face and you, they see your willingness to serve 
and your willingness and, and your determination to give God glory. May they look and say, he must be having the greatest time of his life. Look, look, look at his rejoicing. Let that be true of you, beloved. Dwell on the land, feed on his faithfulness. If he placed you there, he will feed you there. Amen. If he placed you there, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> if he placed you there, he will take care of you there. So make sure you're in the place where he placed you. If you're not, get to the place where he's placed you and he will feed you there. Dwell there, feed on his faithfulness. Don't run to and fro. Be still and know that he is God. And finally, back to Psalm 131, the picture of the weaned child, the picture of the well-disciplined child seated on his mother's lap, content, satisfied, maturing, Weaned means he's gone from milk to solid food. The weaned child is gone from milk to solid food. And God is bringing you from milk to solid food. Now for a baby, the milk is fine. But what a sad thing it is for us to be to the point where we should be eating solid food and we're still on the milk. Milk is a good thing but it has its limitations. And God is bringing you and me to the point where he wants to deal with us as those he can trust with the matters of the soul. So beloved, put your eyes on Jesus. Let's be trustworthy. Let's be content. Let's be happy in the Lord. And if anybody would witness your life, let them say that God is good and his mercy endures forever. Amen. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures. And people can see that truth in my life. So God bless you, beloveds. It is a, it, that, that's a word that was heavy on my heart. I, I hope it settled well uh, in your soul. Uh, and I hope it was like a sweet rain on, on, on a dry desert floor. I hope right now you're, 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 the flower of your life is just like perked up because you have been fed the water of life. Um, and I pray that God strengthen his energy is yours. Once again, the energy of the Holy Spirit, the bread of life, brings you this energy and God is feeding the spirit that's inside of you. This is spiritual food, beloveds. Uh, eat to the full. Uh, the rest of the day as you as you contemplate what God has spoken in your life, work it out. Uh, the, the way that, that, that you make the word all that it can be is to actually work out the word that is spoken to you. Don't let it just be words spoken into your ear. Let it be words that you work out. That is where the bounty is and that is where God gets magnified. So let's choose today to be at ease and at peace within, to keep our eyes and hearts pointed to heaven, to be content, to be settled, to be at rest, to be confident in Jesus, and no man, because Jesus alone sits on the throne with the Father. So let's sit with him in heavenly places. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in, in Jesus' name, we have received instruction. Um, it will work itself out as it ought as we take hold of things in the Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit will work out in us the will of God. And the world will know without a shadow of a doubt that not only is there a God, but that our God is good. And not only is there a God, but there's only one God. Because only our God is good. And his mercy endures toward us forever. Father, help us to be a gracious people. Help us not be a people who cry out for amazing grace for us and judgment for others. Help us, Father God, to be as gracious to those who are lost as you were to us when we were lost. Help us to be as kind to those who disagree with us as, we, as you were to us when we were walking waywardly. Father, before we knew who Jesus Christ is. So thank you for making us the testimony of Christ and making us the assurance that you are good and that you care for men. If people want to know that, they can see that in the Father's house. Thank you for maintaining the Father's house. Um, you have placed us here, Father. So our greatest confidence is that you will continue to be faithful as you have always been to your children. We love you, God. Move by your spirit. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on your church one more time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, beloved ones. Amen, amen, amen. Before we, before Jackie un unmutes us, I just want to 
uh, just take a moment and I, I want to say thank you so much for um, for your presence. Your presence here is magnificent. It is a beautiful thing to see your faces. It's always beautiful to see new faces and, and we're here every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock uh, Pacific Coast time. I also want to thank you for your faithfulness and remind you to continue to be faithful in your giving. Uh, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for continuing to support the work that the Father's House is and the Father's House does. It's a different season and the work looks different than it looked before. And as some of you who are so used to working um, just consistently in the house of the Lord who haven't been able to do that in the last six so so months. So it is a different season, but the house continues and the Lord is, we have a place to meet when that time comes. Thank you for your faithfulness, helping us maintain the things that God has given us. Thank you for your generosity. Let the Lord continue to move through you. Um, this ministry continues to grow. And each one of these lessons, each one of these teachings on Sundays and Wednesdays, by the way, reach tens of thousands of people. And, and, and uh, uh, over the course of a month, uh, uh, we reach in the tens of thousands of people as people are hearing the word of God that's being preached uh, from this platform. So your giving is so important. Thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for your generosity. Uh, and we wanna continue this work and we're gonna dwell in the land and trust God uh, as we do and feed on his faithfulness. And may you do the same, continue to be encouraged um, uh, stay in, uh, in contact with us. Uh, uh, keep checking us out on Facebook and on our website. Uh, as I said, next Sunday evening, uh, we're meeting with the brothers. Uh, we're going to have us a, uh, have us a little fellowship time so next Sunday evening at seven o'clock. That word is going out. And, you know, the ladies are meeting and, and uh, my wife is still conducting youth ministry with our, with our youth and children's ministry uh, goes forth. All the ministries of the church, beloveds, are going forth. And the Lord is also, pray for me as the Lord has seated me out in certain places in our community um, in order just to share the wisdom and the love of God. That, that, is, that is, I know that is my calling, that is my job. And so thank you for continuing to pray and I pray for, for um, Pastor Suzanne and I um, as your pastors, uh, pray for our encouragement. Uh, these are tough times for pastors. Uh, let, me be, let me be very honest with you about this, very tough time for pastors. Um, because it's a very, very different and strange season. Uh, your prayers are so, so important. Amen. So I love you. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Uh, we'll have a Wednesday service that is posted uh, Wednesday evening. Um, contact us if you have any questions, if you have some Bible questions, uh, if, you need, if you need any clarity on anything I've said today. Uh, and also share this teaching. Share it. It's posted. Uh, on YouTube and, and post it on our Facebook page. If it's been a blessing to you, it'll be a blessing to somebody that you love, somebody that you care about. So share, um, and the word is going to continue to go forth as long as the Lord gives us energy and breath. In Jesus' name, I love you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for closing us out. Thank you for uh, drawing us together and blessing us as a church. And may we go forward and be a blessing wherever we go according to the word that has been spoken into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Jack is going to unmute you. You can shout at each other and, and amen. greet. Amen. Amen. God bless Thank you, Jesus. Thank Hallelujah. you, Pastor. Thank you, man of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, come, let us adore him. Blessing and honor to the King of ages. Oh, Father God, receive our prayer.